let's start back. Let's take a step back. You have a really unusual background. You have degrees in music. You played in symphony orchestras. You started, you also taught high school music. And then you started Results, the organization that I mentioned earlier, the anti-poverty lobby. That's a really big leap. So I'm wondering, how did you get from music to ending poverty? How did that happen? Yeah, it's quite a leap. And when I look back for experiences in my life that might have pointed to why this change was happening, there are two experiences that come up. I graduated from high school in 1964, 50 years ago. And at the high school graduation, I learned that a fraternity brother, a year younger, had died the day before in a tractor-trailer accident. And, I, you know, I was 17, and I thought I had forever. And with this loss, uh, I realized maybe I had 17 more minutes or months or maybe years. And so the questions of purpose came up kind of early. Why am I here? What am I here to do? Four years later, college graduation, 1968, Robert Kennedy is assassinated the night before. And it's another one of those, what is this life? What is this death? Why am I here? What am I here to do? No answers. But the questions are getting very clear now. I like to say I'm kind of slow. And nine years later, I'm invited to a presentation on the Hunger Project, on ending world hunger. And I go there thinking, well, hunger is inevitable because that's what I'm thinking, because there are no solutions. Because if there were solutions, somebody would have done something by now. But I go to this presentation. It's 1977. And I realize the obvious. There's no mystery to growing food. There's no mystery to clean water, basic health, basic literacy. I'm not hopeless about perceived lack of solutions, I'm hopeless about human nature, that people just never get around to doing the things that could be done. But there's one human nature I have some control over, my own, and my questions, why am I here? What am I here to do? So I start to get involved. And this is the end of the story. But in 1978, 1979, I spoke to 7,000 high school students. And just before, I, classroom by classroom, 25, 30 at a time. And just before I go into the first classroom, I read some statements from Jimmy Carter's Commission on World Hunger and others that call for the political will to end hunger. So I asked 70, sorry, 7,000 high school students what the name of their member of Congress was. I didn't want to know if they wrote them. I didn't want to know if they met him, just the name. And out of 7,200 new, fewer than 3%, and just over 97% didn't know the name of their member of Congress. And so results started out of that gap between the calls for the political will to end hunger on the one hand and the, the um, lack of basic information uh, on who represented it, me in Washington. And there's this new quote to me that I really come to love by Mark Twain who said, the two most important days of your life are the day you're born and the day you find out why. And, and for me, I was in the why question. And I think for all of us, in a quiet moment, the why is something about giving back, making a difference, having our lives matter. But that's very much smothered by some hopelessness and cynicism and discouragement. And when that hopelessness and cynicism is released, uh, that our natural desire to give back and make a difference, it can be expressed. Wow. That's really something about um, the young people not knowing. I wonder if you ask that question today, if the results would be the same. Well, actually, uh, last fall, I spoke on 15 college campuses. I, asked, I told them that story, and then I asked them, what's the name of your member of Congress? This is the LBJ School at the University of Texas, the Humphrey Institute, University of Minnesota, Oberlin College. 10% could answer correctly wow. on average. 
90% didn't know the name of their member of Congress. So actually it's not changed all that much. When I first was high school, this was university. Wow. Well, you talked about um, political will. I want to I kind of drill into that. I mean, the general notion is that we actually have everything we need to solve many of the world's problems, and particularly around hunger, that where you've been working in that area. We have everything we need except for political will. And so, but yet you've been responsible for engaging thousands of people and then getting them engaged in advocacy. Um, what have you learned about the political will of the American people since you've been doing this work? Well, if I could, I think I'm going to uh, share a quote from the late Jim Grant, the former head of UNICEF, the UN Children's Fund, and then uh, maybe we can discuss more. He said, each of the great social achievements of recent decades, he said this 20 years ago, it could have been the women's vote, uh, civil rights movement, uh, et cetera. He said, each of the great social achievements of recent decades have come about not because of government proclamations, but because people organized, made demands, and made it good political will for governments to respond. It is the political will of the people that makes and sustains the political will of government. And that's the good news and the bad news. If the political will of the people is a bit asleep at the wheel, then the political will of the government will be a bit asleep at the wheel. And I, I would say that that's uh, the downside of our predicament. But I, I could talk about the upside for a moment. Uh, when we started lobbying in results in 1984 on child survival issues, maternal and child health, uh, the volunteers in 1986, generated 90 editorials around the U.S. that year to triple a thing called the Child Survival Fund. Well, the point is, when we started in 84, UNICEF was reporting that 41,000 children under the age of five all around the world were dying every day from largely preventable, underlying preventable, malnutrition and disease, things like measles coupled with malnutrition. The latest numbers for UNICEF is that the 41,000 deaths a day has gone down to 18,000 a day. Now, it's still scandalously high, but it's going in the right direction. And I and people I've worked with for 30 years, we didn't vaccinate any kids, but we were at the center of the advocacy that had, for example, the child survival and maternal a health account go from some fifty million a year to seven hundred million dollars a year because people persisted and people did their homework and people picked up the phone or lifted up their voice. They did their homework first, but then they got engaged and got involved. So when you talk about getting involved, I mean, when I think about nowadays with the Internet and with all the wonderful organizations, MoveOn.org, um, um, Avaz, and so on, and SelfChange.org, I feel like we are, this, especially, you know, a lot of the people probably that's on this call, people that I know, are really engaged, really concerned, and yet you have something in your book that you call Mouse Click Advocates. And that is pretty much what we do, right? We get a petition, we click on it, we sign our We don't even have to sign our names anymore. We just hit send now because all the information is there. And so we do that. Um, and I know many people who do that. And when I, I do that. That you, yeah, when I look at the work that you've been doing, it really takes a lot of time and, and another kind of involvement. I'm wondering... How, with our busy lives, you know, I mean, people are working two jobs, they're trying to make ends meet, they've got kids, whatever it might be, we're really, really super busy. How, with these busy lives, can we get more involved and not just be mouse click, click advocates, but actually do the deeper work? Well, let me say a couple things about that, just about the mouse clicks, which I do too. I'm not urging people to not do that. I'm urging people to not stop there. Paul Loeb, who wrote The Soul of a Citizen, 
uh, said to me last year, you know those e-blast petitions in Congress? Those are counted, but they're also discounted. And so, you know, we need to understand. What do you mean by that? It's kind of like they're counted. You got 500 petitions signed by email today, but they're all so discounted. You know, people click the button, they're probably not thinking about it anymore. It's not, you know, I don't know there's all that commitment behind it. <clears throat> the thing that, one of the things that I would say I, on my tour of the campuses, my main messages were three. Number one, most people feel hopeless and cynical about making a difference with their voices as citizens. That's number one. Number two, for the last 34 years, I've seen people make a profound difference with their voices as citizens. Number three, and this is the tricky part, you have to find an organization that provides a deep structure of support, a rich curriculum that can support you in having breakthroughs as an activist. In other words, most organizations just give us a few mouse clicks. Maybe there's a lobby day once a year in D.C. or something. You gotta, you gotta find an organization that doesn't just keep you in kindergarten and first grade as an activist, but moves you to third and fifth and ninth and twelfth and into college as an activist. And you know the organizations that I've been coaching on the lobbying work, like Citizens Climate Lobby, of course, results which I founded, like the Peace Alliance, they have a monthly conference call with guest speakers and Q&A and uh, grassroots victories shared. And uh, they learn a little talk to be more articulate at the end. That kind of work, not just that, that kind of work is that tutorial that can help us get out of kindergarten and first grade uh, as activists. Yeah, that's really great. And I, I think you're right. I mean, tagging on to a organization that's doing that work, I mean, that's why actually what I'm doing here with the Pachamama Alliance, we have a very robust um, start you at a certain level and continue to grow with, with, with knowledge and, and empowerment and self-empowerment. So I, I agree with that. And so you use you use, the, you use the political process as a means for social transformation. Some people do direct action. I mean, there's different ways of of making, of going towards social transformation. Yours is the political process. And in that, and you really outline in your book, how you really map out, um, you have a whole process that you've mapped out step by step of how it works and, and how you're effective. Can you just kind of condense that for us into, and kind of let us know what is that process? Because it's really brilliant and it's so effective from the work that you're doing. Yeah, I was alluding to some of it a moment ago. For example, if you're in one of the groups that I've been talking about, as I said, there's this conference called GAS. If, it was, if it's results, it could be Jeffrey Sachs or Paul Farmer from Partners in Health or Mo Muhammad Yunus of the Grameen Bank. It, it could be a member of Congress or whatever. You know, and you're in this conversation with, on the issue and on, the, uh, on the, the legislation and that kind of thing. You hear some grassroots victories. Uh, I tell people, don't go in and say, we had a meeting with our member of Congress yesterday. It was a blast. We can't wait to do it again. And you leave out that it took 11 phone calls to get the appointment. or right. that you're, Don't leave that stuff out because people around the country are listening in. If they've made two calls and they don't know it took you 11, you're doing a disservice kind of thing. And I spoke about learning to be more articulate, uh, a role play, or we call it a laser talk or elevator speech, learning to be more articulate so that you can be a spokesperson. So that's one example of one of the pieces of the curriculum. There's an action sheet to take an action every month, a uh, letter to Congress or a letter to the editor. For example, I've been coaching students in climate lobby in the first four months of this year, their volunteers in the U.S. and Canada have had 839 letters to the editor and op-eds published. They're on track to having more than 2,500 letters to the editor and op-eds published this year. 
that's going way beyond the mouse click. Yeah, and that's, so you're talking um, real letters, like yeah. write a letter. Right? In the paper, published. And that's going beyond the mouse click, and that's because, among other things, of a deep structure of support and a rich curriculum. Got it. Yeah. And I know, I know that you, you like to tell five brief stories that paint what you describe as our predicament, right? Stories that people can actually use to walk into activism with their eyes open, but that can still embolden them. Can you huh. give us those five stories? Well, you know, I gave the first two, and I'm not going to retell them. The, uh, fewer than 3% of the high school students knew who their member of Congress was 35 years ago. Last fall, 35 years later, 10% of college students I spoke to. The third story is, a couple of months ago, I spoke to a senior lecture series where I live in Princeton, New Jersey. And they said, you know, they get 200 seniors every lecture. So I said, I don't think so. I went to check it out a month early. There were uh, 200 in the room. And the moderator says, you know, our next speaker is Sam Daly Harris on reclaiming our democracy, healing the break between people and government. And there were chuckles in the room. And it's like the seniors are a little bit oblivious. Sorry, the students are a little bit oblivious. They don't even know who their congressperson is. These one sample of seniors, you could say they were a little um, cynical in laughing at that. Now, the lecture was great. They were phenomenal when I went there and gave the lecture. It's something that, for us to look at. It's some place for us to take a stand in where it's, change is needed. Fourth story. I spoke at Harvard in March and before I had the opportunity, the honor really, of meeting with Marshall Gans, a professor at Harvard, worked with uh, Cesar Chavez for a decade in the 70s, led the organizing in the Obama campaign. Brilliant, brilliant guy. I met with him. He'd never heard of results or citizens climate lobby. And the meeting was all about, so how do you do that? And why do you do it that way? And why do you think that works? And what was the thinking behind that? At the end of the 20 minutes, he looks at me and he says, yeah, but you know, Congress is really dysfunctional. And I said, yeah, Congress is really dysfunctional. And it appropriated $1.65 billion this year for the Global Fund to fight AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria. Congress is really dysfunctional. And it appropriated $700 million this year for maternal and child health programs around the world. I said, Congress is really dysfunctional, but if you roll up your sleeves, do your homework, and get in there, you can make big things happen. And the last story, I spoke at Rutgers last month in New Jersey, and uh, I met with small groups of students before the lecture, like eight at a table. And the last table and the last student who was taking an honors futures class said to me, last question, he said, with a view to 50 years in the future, what's the most important issue we can work on? I said, well, my friends on working on climate change said if we don't work on that and solve it, we're toast. And my friends working on getting money out of politics say, if we don't get money out of politics, nothing's going to work. And others say to me, well, you know, global poverty is a real scandal. I say the issue that we need to work on is that so many of us do not see ourselves as change makers. That's the issue. If we could all see ourselves as change makers and act on that, there wouldn't be enough problems to go around. I mean, the climate issue and the money out of politics and et cetera, et cetera, would be, have an avalanche of activists and volunteers, and this political will we were talking about earlier could really be uh, created. So what would you say to someone who um, says, okay, <clears throat> um, my congressperson is on way on the other side of the issue than I am, and yeah. um, I don't see how I can get through to him or her. What do you say to that person? How do they, what is their next step? Well, let me tell you this great story. Um, it's about a woman named Ellie Sparks. She's in Citizens Climate Lobby. And uh, she 
started Citizen Climate Lobby saying I was suffering from climate trauma. I would read Bill McKibben's book, Earth, and I would weep at home, and I would weep at work. And she said, I joined CCL, and 18 months later, I was co-leading a workshop on great getting relationships with members of Congress and the media. And the first time I heard her was two Februarys ago, about 26 months ago. And Amory Lunds was the conference, conference call at T-Finish, and Ellie came on, and she said, you, the executive director, said, we're betting the farm on relationships. Now go get a relationship with your member of Congress. And she said, well, our member of Congress is Eric Cantor. We're in Richmond, Virginia. He's the House Majority Leader. He's a Tea Party kind of guy. And we couldn't get a meeting with Eric Cantor, but we got a meeting with his legis legislative director. They've since had 10 meetings in 26 months with his leg director. The eighth meeting was with Cantor. I suspect their 11th meeting in June will be with Cantor again. She said there were four of us who went. We had two two-hour preparatory meetings. One of the four of us is a retired naval meteorologist. He brought more of the science to the meeting. Another is an executive coach. He helped us with the agendas for the prep meetings and for the meeting itself. Another of the four of us is Fred, and Fred is Jewish, and the congressman is Jewish, and Fred's known for his baking. So he baked two challah breads one for the congressman and one for the ledge director. And we went into this meeting, this would have been two Januarys ago, and we had a flip chart we brought in, and we said, what are the congressman's values in the area of energy, economy, and environment? And we wrote those down on the flip chart. And the legislative director said, this is the first meeting, you are the most prepared group I have ever met with. So I told that story to head of care, save the children, Oxfam. And I said, you know, I think if I ask a normal climate activist to meet with Eric Cantor or his ledge director, I think they'd say, now, which wall do you want me to bang my head against? Are you thinking that wall over there or that wall over here? I was meeting with the CEO of a U.S. environmental group with 4 million stakeholders. And I'm told that story, but I didn't get to the wall banging part. And before I got to it, the, the CEO says, you know, we wouldn't meet with the Eric Cantors of the world. And then hands cupped in front, we'd meet with those who are with us, rocking back and forth, or those we feel we could move. But we wouldn't meet with the Eric Cantors of the world, which for me was a variation on which wall do you want me to bang my head against? I'll put my money on the Ellie Sparkses of the world who are moving toward their 11th meeting with Eric Cantor's ledge director and several of them with Eric Cantor. That's what I would tell someone. You know, I, they're just people. And if we ain't going to figure out a way to get through to them, frankly, with homework and love, nothing's going to change. Wow. Well. That's 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 a great story. I mean, you, I, basically, we edit ourselves before we even get out the door. Oh that's yeah. What I'm here. We do, and I see that I, with myself. I mean, you know, you think, well, that's not going to happen, and so you go in the other direction, and and like you said, the, the banging your head. Your approach, in in your approach, you've really shown how few people it takes to make an impression on a legislator. Well, part of the uh, how few people is using this concept of Buckminster Fuller, um, who would uh, trim tabbing, using a trim tab. And Bucky Fuller would say, with regard to the, uh, sh a huge ocean liner, if you wanted to turn a massive ocean liner, don't try and push it around from the front. Don't even try and turn the massive rudder. At the end of the rudder is a little rudder called a trim tab. Turn that. And then the rudder will t turn with more ease, and then the whole ship. And he would say, with regard to the ship of state, the government, don't ever try and turn the ship around. Don't even try and turn the rudder. Find the trim tab and yeah. turn that, and then the rest turn. So what are the trim tabs? My member yeah. of Congress would be a trim tab. 
the editorial writer at the local newspaper would be a trim tab. The dean of the School of Environmental Studies might be a trim tab, et cetera, et cetera. But I have to do my ho homework and, you know, not yeah. stop my knees from shaking and step out and uh, mm -hmm. engage. Well, the other thing is that that I find with a lot of progressives or our folks doing advocacy, political advocacy work, is that there's always this binary issue of us and them, you know, um, the right and the wrong. I'm right, they're wrong, and and you know, red states, blue states. I mean, that's that is how we're set up here, and right. and quite frankly, it's just not working. And I'm wondering if there's approaches that you've seen that actually unify people. Well, yeah, it's uh, I have to. I'm going to tell another story. Uh, and um, I was speaking in Minnesota last fall at a college campus, and there was a book group before the, and there were students, faculty, and staff. And one of them was a retired nun. She just retired after 37 years at this Catholic university as a librarian. Uh, this nun, and at the end of the meeting, she said. Oh, this is so great. This is, I just love this. Uh, but the problem is, my congressperson is Michelle Bachman, and I don't really know where to start. And so I had her turn. I had her turn in the book to a prayer. There's a results volunteer in oh, yeah. who had written a prayer for his member of Congress who is like going nowhere, and an Atlanta uh, results person had written it for his member of Congress years ago <coughs> who had voted against salmon aid for Ethiopia in 1985 and almost celebrated the fact that he voted against it. And this friend said, you know, uh, if, if our member of Congress was a, a sports team, we'd be sitting with bags over our heads. We are so ashamed. It's a longer story. The bottom line is they work with them. They, so they use this prayer. And at the end of this prayer, they would stop it and they'd go, yeah, right. But anyway, I asked the nun to read the prayer out loud, but take the congressman in the prayer's name out and put Michelle Bachman's name. I'm going to read it really quickly. It goes, thank you, God, for Michelle Bachman. We know she's a good woman who wants to do right in the world. We know she struggles with the same problems we do, closing our hearts to those who don't agree with us. There are no thoughts or feelings that she has had that we haven't had and vice versa. We pray for all of us to learn compassion for people in our country and far away, for rich and poor. We pray that Michelle and we will be less frightened of each other. We pray our focus will be more to love and appreciate her and less to change her. Help us to remember that sharing love with the world is the highest contribution we can make and will lead to children being fed and the planet surviving. Forgive our righteousness and anger. Open our hearts and minds to find the next expression of love for Michelle that she can receive. Now, the nun was all lit up after she read it, but this group, they would read that prayer, and at the end they go, yeah, right. But they do it regularly, and after a while they took it in, and they would go meet their congressman, and it was, Chat with Pat sessions. His name was Pat Swindoll. They renamed it Spat with Pat because so many people just came and picked a fight. And they would come with new information and a smile and a handshake. And two years later, they asked him to co sponsor micro enterprise, microfinance legislation. And he said, I'd be happy to do so. And they said, We were the only lobby in Georgia that could get liberal John Lewis and conservative Pat Swindoll on the same bill together. And, he, and Swindoll said, you know, I have a column in the um, newspaper. Could you write an op-ed for me to put in my column? We have to educate the public. This is a guy who voted against salmon aid two years earlier on Ethiopia, but they hung in there. They used their prayer. They got over their, shall we say, negative feelings, you know, and, and they made some things happen. That's amazing. I, I remember reading that prayer in the book when I read it, and it was really so beautiful to see. Um, it's so hard, so difficult to to do that because you've made them such the enemy, and and you know you've taken the humanity 
we tell the humanity out of people who think differently than, than ourselves. You know, I, I, have, I have a question. I think it's going to be the last question I'm going to ask before we go into Q&A. So it's a tough time, and um, one of the big blows, I think, that we've had to our democracy is Citizens United, um, one of the most recent ones. And now, I don't know if you're familiar with the net neutrality debate that's going on as we, literally as we speak, with the chair of the FCC who's, who's kind of, they're saying that it is kind of the citizens united of the Internet, um, you know, where big business can pay to, to have speed and ac access to their sites and other people won't. And so, you know, it's like sometimes we think, I think, are, are things getting worse? Is our government getting worse? And I know people who say that we are a corporatocracy masquerading as a democracy. Mm -hmm. Now, I know you've been an activist for more than 35 years, Sam, and you've seen a lot. This is just recent things. You've seen a lot over your time out there working so hard. I wonder what can you share from your early days as an activist right. when, you were so, when you weren't established? Yep. Something that would give people hope, people who might be in their early first days of their activism and in light of these kinds of things like Citizens yeah. United that they're looking at, yeah. what kind of hope can you give? Well, let me tell a story from, uh, well, it was 1982. I was a substitute teacher in the L.A. school system and the founder of Results, and I was working with a friend in New York City who was assistant to the window designer at Be he wasn't even the window designer. He was assistant to the window designer at Bendel's department store. And we were organizing World Food Day candidate forums in Los Angeles, that was me, and New York City, that was Cameron, the two okay. largest cities in the United States. And um, we were uh, working with newspapers and this and that, and I met with a, a writer for the LA Times and I was telling her that a number of editorial writers in the TV stations didn't think hunger was a state or local issue. And she was shocked, and she said, well, did you call the LA Times? I said, yeah, and Anthony Day, and he wouldn't call us back. Oh, she said, well, call um, uh, Kay Mills, the only woman editorial writer at that time. So there's this, this I'm going to read a little, little excerpt. I'm, I'm a substitute teacher calling on my break from a pay phone at a junior high school phone booth. And um, my first t uh, call to Kay Mills was from a phone booth in the main office of a junior high school in East Los Angeles. I walked in, closed the door, and put my diary and grade book on a built-in ledge. We don't usually do editorials on days, World Food Day or Labor Day, Kay said, after a brief conversation. Let's pick an issue and do it. I promised to mail materials on key anti-hunger legislation and follow up by phone. The fourth period bell rang. I said goodbye, hurried back to my classroom. That telephone call and the editorial that followed altered my sense of myself and what was possible. It was normal for me to circulate 100 photocopies of an action sheet or an important article. But when that first editorial appeared, I remember thinking, not only has the LA Times written this, they've made one, one million copies of it, and they've delivered it for us too. How marvelous. This is the end. My early morning dash to the front yard to pick up the LA Times was my run to democracy. I realized that I had the right job to make a difference, substitute teacher. I realized that I had the right training to make a difference, music. I realized that I had the right bank account to make a difference, nearly zero. I realized that making a difference wasn't a function of any of these. It was a function of commitment and persistence, end of quote. And um, yeah, substitute teacher, zero bank account, training in music. That's where I started and so I made big things happen. I love it. And if I can, you can kind of story. What keeps your spirit going? You see wins and failures. This work is really about transformation and breakthrough. 
it's not about petty pace and woe is me. And so what keeps me going is when I see people having a break, when I see people having a transformation from I don't make a difference to I do, from I can't fight City Hall to I am City Hall, those kinds of transformations. And, you know, if you look carefully and you provide a deep structure of support, you'll see them. Thanks for your empowering stories. What organizations, companies today, do you see moving the trim on government? Uh, well, you know, honestly, all the organizations are trying in some way, for better or, or worse, for good or not so good. Um, I keep looking at what do the organizations, and I'm thinking about uh, NGOs, advocacy NGOs, lobby groups. I keep looking at what do you provide the volunteers? That's the question I keep asking. In, in, in other words, on a scale of 1 to 10, 10 being re really deep and rich, most organizations offer 1s and 2s and maybe 3s sometimes. So that's where I, I look. Do, do you go in and you grow as a result? Or do you go in and stagnate as a result? I'm frankly in conversations with um, four pretty wonderful organizations that are about to start coaching with me and learning some of these techniques to empower their members, their stakeholders. And hopefully, if we were to do this a year from now, I'd be listing 10 different organizations that have this focus, not just results or citizen climate lobby or peace alliance as lobby groups or Pachimama Alliance as an educational group. How is the international regulatory climate effect policy change in the U.S.? For example, TPP and other international treaties. Well, yeah, uh, again, I, I, I don't necessarily want to portray myself on the, as an expert on that particular issue. Uh, the bottom line is where, where my expertise is, is on how the groups that are focused on issues like that can better empower their, their stakeholders, can better empower their volunteers. Because absolutely, uh, international policies affect us for good or ill, and we have to be uh, vigilant. And the question is, you know, do they keep us first grade, second grade vigilant? Or are there some opportunities for the vigilance to be as a ninth grader, a twelfth grader, a college student, uh, not just a click and done vigilant? So, yeah, all kinds of international policies can have a, a effects on our lives and on the environment and the like. And the question is, are we going to woe is me them, or are we going to find an organization that really empowers us? Are there any other questions, or I have? Something? I have a question from Nick McLean. And this okay, question right. is Do you have any ideas on how to increase political literacy across the country? Yeah, um, it's funny. I, I mean, how do you explain? that 10% of the students I spoke to uh, knew the name of their member of Congress last fall and 90% didn't. I mean, the only way I can explain it is we teach for the test, not for using it. We, do you know three branches of government? Okay, the test is over. You're all done. You can forget it now. We teach it for the test, not to use it. So, you know, at some level, uh, at the very most local level, I mean, getting involved in your children's school or if you don't have children in school, a neighborhood school and finding ways that uh, students could be engaged, um, study an issue and invite their member of Congress or state legislator to come to the classroom. Those are some examples of things that could be done. Uh, to move it from study for the test and then forget about it. 
I just want to, in in, in that light, I want to give a, a real shout out to. Um, there's an organization here in Oakland called Generation Waking Up, and they're working with young people, waking them up. They have incredible tools that they're using all over the country. They've been outside of the country as well. And so I do want to give that shout out. If you are a parent and if you want your kids, to, your young people to learn from other young people, which is kind of it's easier sometimes for them to hear it from their peers, um, go to Generation Waking Up. Google them. The work that they're doing is fantastic. And it really is uplifting the next generation who are, who are on fire. And, you know, my experience here in Oakland, too, I'm at Oakland, California, is that the young people are on fire here, and they do know a lot, and they are aware. And so it just needs to continue to spread through, throughout. But I would definitely, uh, I can't help but give a shout-out to Jenna, who's doing tremendous work. Great. Any other questions out there, Leah? None right now. Okay. Oh, so, there's another question written that okay. says, how can we reach out to Sam beyond the call? Oh, yes. So my email is Sam, that's the easy part, Sam at empoweringcitizens365.org. Sam at empoweringcitizens, plural, 365.org. And that will do it. And do you have a website? Well, yeah, I'm reclaimingourdemocracy.org will get you to videos like interviews and articles and things like that. That would be a, a, a decent place to start. Reclaimingourdemocracy.org. And so, um, is there another question out there, uh, Leah? It looks like I. I see one written. Can you see them at the bottom of your screen all the way down? I can. That one just came in. Hanessa, you want to read that? Sure. So this is from Hanessa, and the question is, Citizens United is indeed a threat to our democracy. Being a student working with a group to overturn Citizens United, I run into a lot of cynicism. What's the best response to people who don't believe that big money can ever be eliminated from politics? Well, there are a couple things. First of all, uh, I'm, I've been at various tabling events uh, where I've asked people, what's an issue that concerns you? Climate change, global poverty, get money out of politics? Get money out of politics comes in first, typically. In other words, in people's gut, they get it pretty quick, uh, the problem we've got there. I'm not sure I would necessarily spend a ton of time convincing someone who doesn't get it or is really cynical, but in a sense spend more time working together with those who see the problem and want to do something about it. Um, uh, so uh, I, I've been doing a little bit of coaching of a local group, Represent Us, uh, Move to Amend I, is doing some great work. Uh, Reed Strikers, uh, I've met with um, Lawrence Lessig, uh, kind of thing. We just need to um, find organizations that will get us beyond the mouse click on Citizens United, on getting money out of politics, et cetera. And uh, there's sadly not a ton of them that do that yet. So. Is there not another question, or I just want to say that, um, do you see another question before I go? We, we do have one more question. Just okay. to explain, we have a lot of people who call in, and when they call in, they don't get to ask a question. So that's, that's what we're experiencing today. Um, but we have a question from Catherine Mathewson. And um, we'll wait to see if she can come off mute or not. It's looking like that isn't going to work. Catherine, um, why don't you type a question in the Q&A section and hopefully. I wanted to say something while, while she's doing that, Sam. Um, one of the things that I love um, also about your methodology is that you really talk about the importance of inspiration and being able to speak to a, to, to 
what is actually going on and really being able to speak to the problem and um, and how inspiration is key for people to, to reach people. Can you just talk a little bit about inspiration? Yeah, it, it's, it's, pivotal. It, it's pivotal. I mean, you know, it's just something that is so needed. I, I think about a, a short quote from Apollo astronaut Rusty Schweikert who said, we aren't passengers on Spaceship Earth. We're the crew. We aren't residents on this planet. We're citizens. The difference in both cases is responsibility. I would argue that it should be inspiring to, to kind of see the reality of we aren't passengers on Spaceship Earth. We're the crew. And, you know, the, the, the need to just get that inspiration out there. Now, I mean, hopefully we can, when we close, I could read one more little quote from uh, the book and Ellie Sparks and her uh, Sacred and Profound uh, with her member of Congress. Why don't we move right into that? I'd love to hear that quote. I was going to ask you about that. Well, I... Yeah, this is the same woman that I read from or told from at the beginning of the story. And coming from that same conference call where the executive director said, we're betting the farm on relationships. Now go get a relationship with your member of Congress and your editorial writer. She says, well, you know, that first meeting with the editorial writer is like a blind date. Only you've decided ahead of time you're going to marry this fellow. You're going to be sweet and interesting, not too intense. If it doesn't work with the editor, you'll marry one of his friends at the paper, the environment writer, the city editor. Somebody at this paper will find you interesting and compelling. I ask college students, who do you know on campus that talks that way? But at the end, she says this great stuff. And at the end, she says, um, let me find this little section. She says, I went to uh, 20 Hill visits. This is a year and a half ago. And this is what she said about the, that. During our conference, I met with 20 congressional offices. I met with many folks whose view of the world was very different than mine. Going into their offices was hard. I had to let go of a lot of emotional baggage. I could no longer judge them or hold hostility in my heart toward them. I had to let go of my fear of climate change in my fear that they wouldn't listen to me. I had to center myself in love. Releasing fear and centering in love, this is sacred and profound work, end of quote. I say most people, if I said, go meet with 20 congressional offices, they'd say this is hard work or this is dirty work before they did it. She comes away saying, this is sacred and profound work. That's what we need to get to. And this is that same woman who said she started climate trauma. She would weep at home and weep at work until she found the tools, until she wow. found the vehicle, until she found a, a way to make the difference she wanted to make. That's so beautiful. I love that we've ended with that. Um, and I just want to tell the listening audience that before we close, I want to let you know that there's going to be a survey that will be posted. And it's very simple. It's just a simple survey that we really, really need you to fill out if you would. It really helps us move forward um, with this speaker series. And so it's going to be posted now. And um, so if you can fill that out, that would be a wonderful thing for us. Um, and so... Sam, I'm wondering if you can do one more time, give folks your email, how they can reach you. That'd be Sam at EmpoweringCitizens365.org. Great. And so this has been an incredibly enlightening, wonderful conversation. Um, your work in the world is so incredibly amazing. And uh, the, the, the amount of people that you have really turned from just, you know, being cynical to getting engaged is incredible. And so 
I just want to thank you for the work you do in the world and for being on this call with us for a great book. I really, again, highly recommend that people please pick up the book, read it. You'll learn a lot, and you'll get some uh, a lot of tools that are very useful that I'm certainly planning on using. And so I want to thank you, Sam, for taking the time and being with us this evening and um, just keep, keep, keep up the good work. It's been an honor being with everyone. Thank you so much. All right, that's great. So thank you, Sam. And I hope that folks on this call have walked away with some really good tools and some hope of making a difference and knowing that you can make a difference, that we all can make a difference um, and not leave it to someone else because it's really up to us. We're the ones we've been waiting for, right? Yeah. So I want to thank everyone. Um, apparently, um, there's a small problem with the survey. Uh, hopefully, it will be coming up. So I think I see it now. Um, there's a survey. There is the survey. So take a moment. I see it. Um, while you fill that out, I am going to talk a little bit about what you can do in the meantime um, to stay engaged with this wonderful organization called the Pachamama Alliance. Um, so you can sign up for a symposium. The symposium is called Awakening the Dreamer, Changing the Dream. If you are one of the few people who have never been a part of this symposium, I can't recommend it enough. Go on the website of pachamama.org, find a symposium near you, and sign up to it's, it's going to take up four hours of your life, and it will be the best four hours ever. So please do that. It's changed my life, really. Um, or you can watch it on DVD online. So we have it now on DVD, and that's another way to engage. Um, also, if you would, we'd love for you to like us on Facebook. That is, again, that's the Pachamama Alliance. And I want to give you a little heads up about what's coming up next. Um, our next speaker series, the event will be on June the 25th, and we're going to do something special next month. It's going to actually be one and a half hours instead of one hour. We're dealing with a very, very uh, topical subject that's something that's going on right now, um, and it is around GMOs and GMOs in our food, the uh, genetically modified organisms. And so there is something that's going on very intensely right now on the islands of Maui and, and Kauai. Um, people are working very hard to protect their islands from the chemicals of the GMOs. So we're going to actually talk with the people who are right now in the midst of a big battle around this, and we would love for you to join us on that call. So again, it's going to be an hour and a half. Please take the time to let's hear what's going on. It's a very important topic right now, and we will send you a, le a link next week so that you can actually sign up for that. So again, that will be um, mark your calendar for June the 25th. So we're at the end of our show. I hope you have um, marked the survey for us. On behalf of the Pachamama Alliance, I would like to thank you so much for joining us this evening. And I hope to see you in the upcoming months on this wonderful speaker series. And I am wishing everyone out there and all future generations a thriving, just, and sustainable future. Thank you so much, and hope to see you next time. Bye-bye.